It should come as no surprise that there are tons of video game characters out there made to be unnerving. Hell, there are tons of video game characters that probably weren't even intended to come off as creepy, but that doesn't stop them from disturbing some players. This, of course, isn't even a thing exclusive to horror video games. Take a look at pretty much any game, and you'll stumble upon at least one unsettling character, location, or secret. It's quite beautiful, actually. It's pretty strange to play a game with no creepy elements to it. Adding something that sparks fear is pretty much as essential as your game having function controls or your game having a way to win or lose. Okay, I guess that's not exactly true, but come on. It's a staple that has no reason to be dropped. Anyway, yeah, video games can have some really terrifying characters. Whether it's from their designs, the things they do, or being unexpected, these characters could and already have sent chills down the spines of many players. It's thanks to characters like these that we have creepy gaming urban legends and creepypasta. They scared us so much that we wanted to somehow make them even scarier. Those stories don't always last though, but the scars left by the characters do. Haunting people with nostalgia. Nice. You know, whenever a child's afraid of something it's never seen before, they'll usually refer to it as a monster. The thing is though, monsters come in all kinds of different shapes, sizes, and aren't always scary. Take Undertale for example. The inhabitants of the underground are all called monsters, but they aren't all that scary. I mean, take a look at this dog. Would you call this scary? Well, if you keep petting him, then sure. But Undertale shows that the true monsters are determined based on their actions and intentions. Characters like Chara and Flowey are seen as monsters because of their desire to kill and become powerful over others. But lurking around in Undertale are some monsters that deserve to be called something worse than monsters because of just how disturbing they are. One in particular is shrouded in so much mystery that fans have become invested and desperate for answers. The one and only W.D. Gaster. What we do know is very limited. Gaster was the royal scientist before Alphys and the one responsible for the creation of the core. From what the Gaster followers said, because yes, there are Gaster followers, there was an experiment of his that went wrong, he fell into said experiment, and got shattered across time and space. Is this why Gaster looks like this? He looks like Uboa, and I don't really want to talk about Uboa right now. I'll get to you if I ever talk about creepy easter eggs. Is this why Gaster speaks in wingdings? Speaking of wingdings, the river person will sometimes tell you to beware of the man who speaks in hands. As if I already wouldn't be cautious around this guy. There's also Gaster's very own entry, which when translated, reveals a very ominous message. You can sometimes call him too, in which this happens. The longer he says a mystery, the longer his creepiness lasts. Will we ever get more answers about Gaster, or will he remain to be a creepy mystery? It all depends on how long Toby Fox wants to toy with us. I think he likes leaving his fans confused. It may not be super obvious, but Doom is a horror game. Of course, there's the joke of, yeah, this is a horror game. One where you are the horror. And I like that because the Doom Slayer or the Doom Guy, I don't know which one I should say, because Slayer sounds more threatening and like the metal band, while Doom Guy just sounds hilarious and I love it. Anyways, in Doom, you go to hell and make your way through every demon you find with things like your own fist, never use this, tons of guns, a chainsaw, and a bunch of original weapons that are also really brutal and fun to use. It's super badass, but not all demons you go up against are the same. There are some that can be pretty terrifying to encounter and fight. Different demons do this for different people, but for me, that demon would be the Pinkies. Now it's not like these are an exception to the whole rip and tear rule, but they easily become quite stressful to deal with. Maybe that's not the right way to put it since you can take Pinkies down with ease using weapons like the shotgun, gatling gun, and chainsaw. The thing is, you'll have to be prepared to deal with these things at all times. Pinkies are quite bulky and drain your health by charging at you. If you see one of these things, you'll want to keep your distance and take it down as quickly as possible. But what about the invisible ones? Yeah, there are invisible ones. And they're even more threatening. Chances are, the invisible pinkies will come at you when you least expect it, and you won't be completely prepared for an enemy you can't see. 
Your best choice is to either use the Gatling gun and fire away, or whip out the chainsaw and have it charge straight into the blades. But again, how well prepared will you be when you suddenly realize there's a pinky six feet from you charging straight for you? I'm trying to maintain social distancing here and this thing just doesn't want to comply. Pianos! They're... Yeah. Well, I mean, is this all that unexpected? Okay, yes it is, even if you are in a ghost house. It'll startle you and maybe even scare you to the point where you won't even be able to continue to play. But eventually, you'll be able to handle evading this evil instrument and continue through the haunted house. You'll be in full control. It's a good thing this house isn't some area where you wouldn't have normal human movement control. Like, say, the sky, or outer space, or underwater. Yay, we're talking about water levels! Don't you just love water levels? I sure do! Underwater, your movement options are nothing compared to on land, and video games like to keep that mentality. Well, as long as you're playing as a human character, someone like good ol' Mario. This means he'll have trouble dealing with basically any underwater enemy. Cheap Cheeps, Bloopers, and that fat-ass Big Bertha. But what about what lies under the sunken ship in Jolly Roger Bay? Holy shit, what is this and why is this in my Mario game? So these Unagi Eels, or Maw Rays, were introduced in Super Mario 64 where you have to provoke them into attacking you so you can enter through their hiding hole. But do you really want to provoke an intimidating predator like this when you're in its own element? Plus, look how big this thing is compared to you. Hell, even the smaller ones in New Super Mario Bros. are intimidating. Speaking of, that game also has giant eels which follow you ready to devour you. Then there's Super Mario Odyssey which throws you one after another after another. And let's not forget, you're underwater. You can only swim for your life in these situations. No running, jumping, sliding, just swimming and hoping you don't become an eel snack. Pianos aren't looking too scary now, are they? It's always a bit strange considering non-video game exclusive characters in these video game countdowns because while a character may be creepy and unsettling in a show or book where they come from, they may not appear the same or act the same in a video game. But I can still consider non-video game original characters based on what it is they do in a game that makes them creepy there specifically. Now that that's been addressed, let's talk about the Scarecrow. Jonathan Crane, aka Scarecrow, is a Batman villain that debuted in the DC Comics in 1941. He was made to be a horror-based villain because I guess the Joker making clowns scary wasn't enough. He's made multiple appearances in DC video games, but the one where he made the biggest impression was Arkham Asylum. Basically, this game showed just how good and accurate a Batman video game could be. You know, because licensed games are usually cash grab pieces of shit. But yeah, this game made you feel like you were the stealthy vigilante detective and like you were really going up against some of Gotham's most deadly criminals. Except for Joker at the end of the game, but pretty much everyone else, like the Scarecrow, was done right. With Scarecrow loose in the asylum, he's free to torment everyone, including Batman, with his fear gas. This forces anyone exposed to the gas to suffer through nightmares of their worst fears. And Batman's nightmares are incredible and incredibly creepy. Of course, there would be illusions of things like Commissioner Gordon's death and his dead parents as zombies? Ghosts? Nope. Jump scares. But then they also thought, hey, since we're fucking with Batman, why not fuck with the players too? That's why one of the nightmares starts with what looks like the game glitching and resetting, when in reality, that was all scripted and the opening cutscene that plays has some rules reversed. Joker captured Batman, everyone taunts him, he gets killed, and then the game tells you you should have used the middle stick. Right, because everyone's playing Arkham Asylum with an N64 controller, and you have a few boss fights against Scarecrow where he's massive and you have to sneak your way through fractions of rooms and walls floating in this void so you can make your way up to a bat signal and defeat the Scarecrow. It's just... brilliant and unnerving. Scarecrow also made a return in Batman Arkham Knight where he was the main villain. Yeah, Scarecrow is the main baddie, not the character who the game was named after. Hey, this guy unmasked Batman in front of the entire world. I think he deserves a game named after him. Bat
Did you know Metroid took some inspiration from Alien? You know, the famous horror film with the scary xenomorph? I guess that makes a ton of sense when you look at things like Ridley's design being similar to a xenomorph, the protagonist being a badass female, and the eerie, desolate setting. Maybe Metroid wasn't as eerie in the first game, but Super Metroid knew just how to improve on that. The soundtrack is distinct and sounds unsettling, characters were redesigned to be more intimidating, and Mother Brain has... no change. It's just a brain in a jar waiting for you to shoot it to pieces. I mean, come on, you fixed everything else, couldn't you at least have done something to fix- I TAKE IT ALL BACK! Okay, this just went from 0 to 100. How did we go from a sitting duck to this 16-bit dinosaur from hell? And don't forget, you have to fight this thing. And the fight itself is pretty interesting. You have to shoot this thing in the head, but now it's a moving target that's more capable of defending itself. There's also a part of this fight where it's scripted for you to nearly die before you get your ass saved by a baby Metroid, which absorbs Mother Brain's powers and transfers it into Samus so she has more energy and hyper beams to finish off this behemoth. Oh, thank god. I thought I was fucked. Never pull another one like that again, alright Super Metroid? Majora's Mask is probably the creepiest Zelda game, and one of the creepiest Nintendo games. This game made the moon scary. I think that says a lot about this game. But yeah, let's talk about the title character, Majora. So Majora, if I'm understanding this wiki article correctly, is an insane childlike spirit who inhabits this ancient mask. From there, Majora also possessed Skull Kid and did a bunch of other unusual and chaotic things. It has no clear motives. All it wants is destruction. All of this from this one creepy mask. But then you get to the moon, which looks like this eerie, empty field, and you have to fight Majora. It can't get any worse than this, can it? Uh. Uh. Um. Yes, thanks for becoming a flesh monster. First, just flesh tentacles, then this flesh ballerina with unnerving movements, and finally this bulky flesh monster with whip hands. You got three days to save the earth from this thing. Good luck, kid. Oh wow, another Mario character? You must be a real pussy. Her her her. No. Mario may be a family-friendly video game franchise, but that doesn't mean that lurking somewhere in pretty much every Mario game is at least one creepy place, character, or secret. But does that carry over when you make everything paper? Of course, there's still disturbing stuff in Paper Mario. Have you seen Super Paper Mario? This game is dark. The story has Count Black and his minions use the Void to destroy all worlds and create a perfect one that can replace the current ones. Not to mention, you see a world get destroyed, you enter the Underworld, or the Underwear, and then there's Count Black and his minions. His minions are... not much compared to Black. Maybe Dementio for some reasons that involve spoilers, but it's kind of tough to surprise after realizing that Count Black murdered his father. In the lore of a Mario game! So yeah, his minions have to be something real special, not like this little girl. You're going to have to do something better than that. I don't like this! I don't like this! This is Mimi, a shapeshifter who only cares about her rubies. As a shapeshifter, she likes to trick you in order to gain whatever she wants. When that fails though, she's got her true form. And it's unlikely anyone saw this coming. Her true form is this giant spider monster with a crumpled paper face. She's also invincible in this state. Well, at least until Merle uses her power to take that invincibility away. Oh yeah, and the neck twisting. It's... It's not okay. That one move where she turns her head into a makeshift saw blade is just really unsettling to think about. Family-friendly Super Mario Bros, right? Some horror characters have become ageless thanks to their impressions in their debut. These characters had some qualities that were so scary and so memorable that the players became scarred and shared their scars with others. Because of this, characters like the Pyramid Heads in Silent Hill 2 earned their way up to being some of the most memorable horror game enemies. Hell, they're probably so creepy that they could be called some of the most memorable enemies in video games, period. The Pyramid Heads have similar designs to Butchers and Executioners, what with their smocks and their GREAT KNIFE! 
AKA a giant knife that's so heavy that these things move so slow and is kind of hilarious to watch. What's not funny to watch are the cutscenes with the pyramid heads. They do things like sneak up on James and smack him back like he's nothing, kill and hump mannequins. Yes, that really happens and it felt very awkward writing that into the script and saying it out loud. And kill your wife. Twice. It's also revealed that they symbolize James's wish to be punished for killing his wife, Mary. That's just... Damn. That sure is one way to punish yourself. Some characters have some very unusual origins. Not like a superhero origin story. The origins of a character's conception. You know, things like the Joker being inspired by the man who laughs, Donkey Kong being inspired by King Kong, Sans secretly being Ness. Speaking of Sans, I, I mean Ness, one character from Earthbound has a really disturbing conception. What has to be the most disturbing conception for a Nintendo character. That actually comes from the final boss of Earthbound, Gygus. Previously in Earthbound Beginnings, he basically looked like a generic alien in some kind of pod. This game's Gygus wanted to build an army to force horror and infinite darkness upon the Earth, after failing his initial mission to reclaim PSI knowledge from humans. In Earthbound, however, this is what Gygus looks like. Quite the jump, wouldn't you say? Ten years later, Gygus returns and succeeded in ruling the Earth with infinite darkness. He also ended up destroying his body and mind, which is why he takes his undefinable form. He literally becomes pure evil. He becomes an unstable universal threat. But yeah, what inspired him to look like all of this? This distorted Ripley pattern of the fun is infinite Sonic seen through a Virtual Boy. If you don't know, take a wild guess because I doubt you'll actually think Gygus' inspiration is true. Shigesato Itoi confirmed that Gygus is based off of a sex scene in an adult film he accidentally walked in on as a child and mistook for a rape scene. Probably because apparently that scene went from sex to murder. Gygus was based off the terror he felt witnessing that scene and... I guess this is what terror looks like to a toy. It's probably what terror looks like to a lot of other people now too. If by some chance you saw my 2017 version of this countdown, chances are you've noticed a lot of similarities. You've probably noticed a lot of the same franchises and some of the same characters. As time goes on though, some of my opinions change, hence why I'm updating this countdown. The time also gives me time to reflect and consider some other characters I didn't initially think of. And that's kind of strange because before, I talked about Resident Evil 4's regenerators for good reason, but I somehow forgot about another Resident Evil character that pretty much terrified me instantly. But yeah, after being scarred by him, it was shocking that I forgot to include Nemesis in that countdown. And seriously, holy shit, Nemesis is fantastic at being a relentless terror out for your blood. Nemesis was created after the other tyrants, like the first one from RE1, which you only got to see at the very end of the game, and the one in RE2, who's always following you because he wants to go give it to you. The natural progression would be to make something that's even less likely to stay down, and with extra abilities and intelligence to make it easier to do its job. That job being to eliminate all stars in Raccoon City and anything else that gets in its way. Seeing Nemesis do this both in cutscenes and in gameplay is more than enough to get your adrenaline pumping. The first thing that I ever saw of Nemesis in action was his first cutscene in the OG RE3. The scene where Nemesis comes out of nowhere with his freaky pre-rendered model as he slowly approaches a helpless Brad and kills him with a tentacle through the mouth. Cause yeah, he has tentacles! And the internet loves tentacles too much. Probably not these ones since they can kill you. And tentacles that can pierce through people and function as Nemesis' grappling hooks or lasso isn't all that he has. Nemesis is strong and durable as fuck. He'll crash through walls, he'll take enough damage to leave him kneeling. Until he gets up seconds later, and he can mutate if he's badly damaged. So yeah, if you thought you could blow him up in a train car, guess what? He'll come back as a quadrupedal monster with claws, boosted agility, and a fucking xenomorph head. And then there's his final metamorphosis, where you have no choice but to face this... uh... slug? 
which, in the remake, blossoms into a nemesis wall. It takes a railgun to finally put an end to him, and all these other chump final bosses take a measly rocket from a rocket launcher. Oh, and did I mention that Nemesis has a rocket launcher of his own? Yeah, when making Nemesis, they made him so he'd be smart enough to use weapons like firearms. Because of this, you have to run from him and fight him while he's armed with things like a rocket launcher, a flamethrower, and a Gatling gun. Remember when Mr. X ever used anything other than his fists or claws? No, Nemesis is one of a kind. Being a famous horror game monster that came back this year to bring back old nightmares and give new players the same nightmares he gave the players of the original RE3. Hell, he's even in Marvel vs. Capcom games. That's right, a monster this gory was able to slide in a T-rated game. Spread the fear to everyone. No one is safe from this tyrant.